Well, thank you and welcome to Kaplan. Uh, it's nice to be back here in Hong Kong. I missed the uh, spring program here because I was working at a not-for-profit that was in some financial difficulty in the United States, helping them uh, get through their uh, time of need. And uh, once that was accomplished, I was able then to come back to Hong Kong. And it certainly is nice to be back here. I really enjoy my stay here. Let me just talk to you a little bit about what we're going to be doing, you and I together tonight, and then with Janet, with her part. Uh, you're going to learn about me a little bit. We're going to show you some things about the CFA program. And then we're going to do go through some of the lecture notes briefly to get a flavor for how class is conducted, but also the types of learning experience you need to have uh, when you are preparing for the CFA or uh, waiting for this thing. I'll give a little background on my experience. Um, I got my CFA charter in 1988, and, and I, that fall, I started teaching CFA classes for the New York Society of Security Analysts and have been teaching CFA classes on since that time through Pace University, where I was an associate professor, and then full time for the New York Society, where I took over their CFA programs. Uh, while I was at the New York Society, I wrote the level one, two, and three notes for our review classes. When we partnered up with uh, Schweizer, Schweizer it's pronounced here, uh, we, uh, then I started writing some of the uh, materials for, uh, and uh, I've really uh, gotten into it quite extensively. You can look at the, the rest of this, um, the Vita here, it, it's self-serving, it's just who I am. Tonight's agenda, take a look. I'm going to lead you through the CFA program. Janet will talk to you about developing your study plan in here. Uh, what is a CFA? Is it something you like to do? Is it right for you? Well, I will tell you if you are interested in the finance business with regard to a corporation, with regard to the finance function, if you're interested in getting into the investment side of the business, either equity analyst, portfolio management, the CFA has become now the union card. That is to say, almost a requirement for positions in this field. Uh, it is a uh, program that, uh, that em uh, employers are very happy with the content and know that you have passed a series of three rigorous examinations and have the background necessary to perform the jobs that they will give you. Uh, I will not lie to you. Uh, it is a very difficult program. Uh, it, it, it's just, it's an endurance contest. Uh, there will be times when you want to scream, cry, and I just go ahead and do it, because I did. I was so frustrated. And here I was, I have a PhD in finance, and yet still going through the program, I found sometimes it was just utterly difficult and uh, really had uh, uh, some sessions where I, did, oh, I don't need this. I have a PhD. Who needs this? But I'm glad I stuck it out. I'm glad I continued with it. And I think it's one of the best decisions that I ever made. But it, again, it's, is it right for you? It depends upon your career path. If the investment field, the finance field is where you want to go, then I would say the CFA charter is the way that you want to get that entry into that or to advance your career within that field. And you can see with some of the advantages in here. It is recognized around the world. The headquarters is in Shrenia. Trust me, this is a backwater town in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but it is a global now, and it's, uh, and it, uh, is the CFA charter, CFA designation is recognized around the world. Global networking, uh, lifelong learning. Uh, the networking, you'll find charter holders all over. Uh, be in contact with them if you get involved with the CFA Institute, uh, the local society here in Hong Kong or wherever you may go in the world, it gives you contacts and a means of advancing your career. It is lifelong learning. The CFA Institute uh, has a voluntary uh, continuous education program, but uh, their materials that they send you as a charter holder are very much toward advancing your knowledge within a field. We have very high standards of ethics that you must comply with, and even some are more stringent than we see in some of the countries in which CFA charter holders are located. It is, though, as it says last year, a serious and uh, for a serious investment professional. If you really want to get into this field and advance your career, the CFA charter holder designation is the way 
that you want to go. You can see the next slide in here, just the members, the charter holders. It's 910854, and that was 1988. So you can see there how many have come along since that time. And the number of candidates, I think that when I was a CFA candidate, there were probably around seven or 8,000 candidates altogether for all the three levels, one, two, and three. And you can see how the program has just expanded and grown exponentially over the years. Um, one of the things that, uh, just some key points on the CFA program, uh, it's, of course, the CFA Institute, Charlottesville, Virginia, United States. Uh, it was established in 1962. That was the first exam. At that time, you needed one exam to get a charter. And they had like a 98% pass rate for the test. And that was the last time you ever saw that happen. They went to two levels, then to three. Uh, we'll talk more about the exam in just a minute. They do have professionals working on the curriculum. It's not all academics of the curriculum. And they try to make it as real world as possible within a test environment. And they are constantly trying to keep the knowledge focused on what you need as an investment professional. You can see, again, you can look at your own slide package you have in front of you uh, where the occupations are. They take a survey every year and look at uh, where people respond to of them, but still that's a large block altogether. And then moving on to other fields in here, employers, investment company, mutual funds, broker dealers, private wealth management, and others down the line across here. Others would include academia. Uh, when I was a CFA charter holder, I was in the other category because I wasn't technically an investment professional by teaching. So see the breakdowns that all of this. Top employers, it's all around the world. Um, this is just, again, it gives you an idea of the types of employers that are after charter holders. Again, you can look at the market if you're already employed. Now, the exam process. Yeah, you have to have a bachelor's degree or its equivalent. Final year of your study. You'll have to have four years of qualified work experience before you receive your charter. So it's possible that you'll pass all three levels of the CFA exam while you're accumulating your work experience, work that extra year, then you get your charter. But you can state to the world that you have passed all three levels and are waiting to complete your work experience to get your CFA charter. And so um, the work experience is defined by the CFA Institute. It's very broad. I got mine through academia, although I had been an uh, economic forecaster for a private firm uh, before that. But they give a wide, wide latitude in that work experience. So it's not really too hard to get uh, if it's somehow related to the investment field. Now the exam process, as you see here, you have, you get your registration in here. You take the level one exam. The level one exam is offered twice a year, in June or in December. The level two exam and the level three exam are offered only in June of each year. And then once you've gotten that, then uh, if you have the experience necessary, you'll be awarded the charter. If not, then you'll wait till you get the relevant experience, and your charter will be issued to you. Some things that you should always bear in mind for this, and starting in this program, 300 hours of study per level. They talk about 18 weeks of study and they are 15 to 20 hours a week of study time to successfully complete an examination. That's the CFA Institute recommended guidelines on that. And we'll speak more about this in a little bit. Uh, you see that once you have completed everything you do your professional conduct statement, which sign you're, you're saying to the CFA Institute, I've been a good person, haven't made any violations of anything. Uh, you pay your dues, and <laughs> don't forget that. And then you become a member in good standing with your charter. And each year, as a CFA charter holder, you will pay your dues and do what we call the PCS, that is the professional conduct statement. That's one of the key requirements of being a charter holder. Now, 
the three levels of the exam. Level one. Level one is a really a review uh, of a bachelor's degree in finance or investments, if you have that. And we'll talk about the topic areas in just a little bit in here. But it is a review of many of the concepts you've had in college over the course of your college career. Level two moves on a little bit. I like to t teach this or do this in this way. Level one, we treat you like a new hire in a company where I've got to go in and I've got to teach you all the skills necessary to be an investment professional. So level one is like going through and reviewing the college. Make sure you've got all your skills up to um, where they should be. Level two, we take you now and we make you an analyst. It could be fixed income, equity. We talk about valuation concepts, getting a value for something. And that's a key part of the level two examination. So we look at companies, industries, we'll look at equity, we'll look at fixed income, value derivatives, other things. Level three brings it all together. Now you've advanced up the firm, you're a senior portfolio manager, director of research, you've got to integrate and synthesize everything that you've learned over the course of the program and then make investment decisions. At all three levels, we have ethics. It's a key part of it. On the examination, if you are borderline pass-fail, most likely they will look to see how you scored in the ethics portion of the test to determine whether your final will be a pass or whether you'll be taking level one, two, or three all over again. So they do take the ethics very seriously. And if you've done very well in ethics, but kind of so-so eh, and the rest of it, it, there is a good strong likelihood that they'll give you the pass. But of course, that's up to the committee down in Charlottesville to make the final determination. Now, you can see the, the curriculum areas. Ethics it goes across all three levels. Investment tools, we have quantitative methods, which is basic statistics, uh, regression, multiple regression, time series analysis, covered at levels one and levels two. Uh, economics goes macro, micro, international, and then some specific themes covers all three levels. Financial reporting and analysis uh, at levels one and levels two. Uh, corporate finance, really all three levels in one form or another. Equity, fixed income, derivatives, alternative investments, this block right here uh, at all three levels. Portfolio, management and wealth planning, a little bit of portfolio management at level one, a little bit of level two, but it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's the main thrust or a key part of the level three examination. You can see the weights on the different parts as you move through the levels. I'm not going to work through this. You can read this on your own in here. But the key parts in here, I so let me just look here. Just Most everybody, level one, is that where we are in the scheme of things? Level one. Okay, for level one, a couple of things I'm going to show you in here. Financial reporting and analysis is 20%. And if you look on there within these breakdowns in here, you'll see that's the single big old level on the uh, examination for level one, more biggest block in here. And quite honestly, it gives people a lot of problems uh, because of all the accounting that's involved with that. It may be that it's been a while since you've had accounting. Or maybe you didn't have accounting. And so therefore, it, it brings a big challenge for people, for the people at level one. The rest of these levels have uh, uh, less weights in there than uh, the, the financial reporting analysis, but that's the one that is the, has the biggest weight and gives the people the most problem, uh, typically. Uh, quant being second. Uh, a lot of people that have not uh, had quant or had it in a while and or don't like doing a lot of number working with basic statistics and some of the other things. So that's probably the second area that gives them the, the most amount of problems. Economics is at 10%. Uh, is there is so much for economics that it's so few points. I can show you the economics reading book in here. It just goes on forever. There's financial reporting right here. It's fairly thick. Hope it's there. Yeah, yeah. here's economics. This is 10% of the exam right here. And it goes on and on and on. And so that's the one also because there's just so much of it that uh, gives people problems too. There's so much they could test on for so few points. Now, the exam itself for level one. 
240 multiple choice questions. There'll be 120 questions in the morning, three hours, three hours in the afternoon for another 120. You have about 90 seconds to answer each question. Timing yourself is very important in this process. Uh, the, each question has the same weight. All right, each item on the multiple choice consists of a STEM question, and then actually this is incorrect. Uh, you have two distractors and the right answer. The distractor is, a, is the answer that is so close to being right, but it's not right for whatever reason. And so you have the right reason, but you, then you have the two distractors that are trying to pull you away from the right answer and determining which one is the correct answer and where the distractors is a key part of the examination. One of the worst things I've seen candidates do on the test is this. They know that the correct answer is A. So they mark on their exam paper, they mark down A. But they sit there and try to prove themselves why it's not B or C. Nobody cares. Move on. Move on. You got the answer, you're sure that one's right, move on. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. It's not guilty with an explanation. This isn't traffic court. This is an exam. Circle it and get going. Level two, we have the item sets, which are long paragraphs, and then a series of multiple choice questions on that. And then level three, you have 50% of the item sets, and then 50% constructed response or essay. And it used to be when I took the exam, it was essay all the way through. Level one, two, and three were all essay. And then they moved, they switched to level one being half essay, half multiple choice. Then they got so many candidates in there that the grading became horrific. So they moved level one to all essay where they could just run it through a Scantron and get the scores that way. Level two was then moved to all multiple choice. And then finally level three, uh, half multiple choice, half um, uh, these uh, essay questions. The reason why they moved that so many candidates, the grading process is something they try to be as fair as possible in the grading process. So when I was a grader, we would sit in a room very much like this at a university, University of Virginia, in Charlottesville, Virginia, we would grade. But every day they would take our scores and they would look at them, they would take an average of what scores I gave for a question and every other member on the team that I was with. And they, if we were outside bounds statistically of where we ought to be, we had to go back and look at the questions again and make sure that we weren't, you know, I wasn't giving you too many points or I wasn't taking away too many points. And they were trying to be very fair, and they still do this process today. But for everybody else, they just run it through the scanner, and you see the questions either right or it's wrong. Now, minimum passing score was 70% of the total points. So they would take the 240, well, 360 actually, was, you know, 240 question times 1.5 marks per question, so 360 points, times 70%, and that was your passing score. Then what they decided to do was to take 70% of the average of the top 1%. So the average of the top 1% could have gotten 95% of the questions right. They would take 75% of that, and that passed. However, since 1989, they use a combination of everything in here. They look to see how certain questions were asked. Ethics is a key area in here. Uh, and they look at areas where they believe that candidates should have a minimum base of knowledge. And therefore, now, a uh, more and more complicated scheme for uh, the passing. We're not too clear on it because they don't disclose this out. And so if you can see a mathematical formula as to how these are determined, uh, they try to be as fair as possible, but they are looking now more rigor with regard to standardizing the test and using standardized uh, procedures for determining who passes and who fails. Uh, CFA Institute have never failed a candidate scoring over 70%. Um, I would assume that to be true. I really don't know that as a fact, uh, but I, would, I, I see no reason why that would not be. Uh, that that should be a passing mark, easy, uh, in this day and age. And then I guess marginal students, if you're on that borderline between pass-fail, uh, your ethics scores will be a contributing factor as to whether they give you the pass or not. Now, exam results. We had 202,000 candidates in 162 cities. This is something that here that is, amazes me, but 
I'll tell you why I'm not too surprised in just a second. In the June exam, we had a 42% pass rate. Now, this is global. This is everybody. The level one exam for December was a 36% pass rate. You've got here, between January and June to study, here you've got really between now and uh, December to pass, but there would be a lot of retakes. A lot of people who took the June exam will come back and sit for the December exam. I would have expected the December exam pass rate to be higher. And it's not. And I'll tell you why, and this applies to you. And that is because people wait. You've got to start now with your program. If you're taking this exam in December, you've got to start now. 18 weeks goes by fast. And if you look at a calendar and say, okay, that exam's going to be on December, December 5th. I gotta go back 18 weeks. <laughs> that's, that's a week from now, pretty much. You've got, and this is what people wait, and they don't have the prep time in here. And this is why we're seeing this pass rate in December, I believe, being lower than the June. You gotta remember again, a lot of people take the June exam and fail, will sign up again for the December exam. So I would the December exam score should be higher on a pass. So it's not, because people wait. The time to begin is now. You'll also see the pass rates for level two and level three. We'll worry about that when we get there. That, 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 we gotta get through one first, then we'll worry about the rest of the stuff. You know, first things first. You can see how the pass rates have gone from 1963 to nine, uh, 2010, and they've gone down. I'm right in here, it was 85 when I started the program, and then it was about 88 when I got my charter. So it was 86, 87, 88 for me, with level one I took in 86, level two in 87, and I got my charter in 1988. So that's my range, and it's gone down, you know, see across there, how the thing has gone down. It doesn't, the exam has gotten harder, no question about that. But is it impossible? And the answer is no, it's not. A lot more material, but there are handy elements that you have now that are not available when I was a, taking it as a candidate. And I'll describe that in just a little while. Here you can see again the pass rates one more time. You can read this stuff when you look at it. I don't want to scare you. I mean, it probably everybody's going to beat the door and say, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. Forget it. Um, the idea is this. What's the point of having a club if everybody can be a member? So they set the bar. If you make the bar, you're in the club. And that's where you want to be. And it's going to take hard work. No question about it. All right, well, I'm not going to get into this. You can see the cross in here signing up and everything. The CF Institute is not for profit, but they make a nice profit on their income statement, trust me. The dues alone are out there. All right, the exam is the 4th of December, and you can see the two sessions, you have three hours in the morning, and then a break for two hours, and then uh, 